Good evening and welcome to another Zoom special talk brought to you by the Zionist Federation in London and the World Zionist Organization in the United Kingdom. I'm James Marlow, who has stepped in for Paul Charney at the last moment, uh, simply because he's been asked to do another talk. And I'd also like to mention the new CEO of the Zionist Federation, Steve Winston, who's also with us this evening. Uh, he's working behind the scenes with all the technicalities, uh, the faders and the buttons, and just making sure that it all works as it should be. We have this evening over 200 registered viewers. I think it was 221 registered viewers for this evening's event. Uh, so please, please can I ask each person if they wouldn't mind muting their microphones and also turning the video settings to the off mode. Uh, and please don't take offense of that. It's simply so we can just focus on the actual talk this evening. But nevertheless, you will have the opportunity to submit questions through the chat facility, which is just below. And I will do my best to ask um, our speaker this evening uh, these questions towards the end of tonight's talk. Uh, so once again, please just make sure that you are on mute, of course, except for myself and our speaker, and that the camera is flicked to the off position. So without further ado, our speaker tonight was the founding director of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies and a professor of political studies at Barilan University. In fact, he has a very, very, very long list of accomplishments, including the writing of five books. And I can tell you, as somebody who's been struggling to write a book, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, he's also an expert on Israeli strategic security issues and, of course, Middle East policy. And so, please help me welcome this evening from the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, Professor Ephraim Embar. Good evening to you. Good evening. Uh, shalom to everybody from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, we'll speak uh, uh, today or this evening about a fascinating subject, which is Turkey. Uh, Turkey is an important state. Uh, it was once an empire, the Ottoman Empire. It has uh, 85 million people, uh, like uh, Iran, uh, a little bit uh, less than Egypt, the three important uh, powers in the Middle East. It is a member of the G20 with uh, GDP of uh, $770 billion. Uh, its strategic location is very important, and I'll show you now a map, so we'll see, we'll be able to, to see where, where it is. You know, my experience with um, American audiences uh, tells me that uh, they really don't know always, you know, what is what and where. So uh, I hope that uh, education in, uh, in the UK is better. <laughs> but, uh, you are less, uh, you know, provincial than the Americans. So uh, this is uh, the, United, the Middle East. Turkey, uh, you know, is at the top. Uh, and uh, uh, bordering, you know, important countries like uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, it is of course uh, along the Mediterranean, it has a long Mediterranean coast. It, part of it is in Europe and it uh, borders here Greece and Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, it is important to remember that it has an imperial heritage. Uh, you know, I meet uh, British people, they, some of them do not forget that they were once an empire. They also don't forget and uh, it is uh, uh, beyond what I've said, it has the largest army in, the, in NATO, uh, well-equipped uh, army, uh, with the exception, of course, the United States. And uh, in contrast to some other NATO members, the Turks are ready to fight, uh, which is uh, important. They still have uh, martial qualities. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the 21st century Turkey, which is very different from uh, what we knew before. And I want to say a few words about the domestic roots of its foreign policy. Uh, since uh, 2002, the uh, AKP, the Islamist Party, 
uh, took over uh, in elections. Uh, Turkey, uh, led by a formidable politician and the political leader, uh, Erdogan, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, and uh, he uh, uh, changed Turkey uh, together with this party. What we see, two important trends which do affect also its foreign policy. First of all, uh, a systematic Islamization of the country, and I'm ready to elaborate later uh, during the Q&A period about that. I'll speak primarily about foreign, uh, foreign issues rather than domestic issues. And the second uh, uh, trend in domestic politics increased personal uh, authoritarianism, uh, which of course increases uh, the influence and power of uh, the undisputed leader, uh, Erdogan. In terms of uh, foreign policy, uh, we see uh, an Islamic overtone uh, in, uh, in their uh, foreign policy actions, and also uh, uh, Ottoman impulses, uh, getting involved in areas which were once uh, part of the Ottoman Empire, actually, uh, with exception of, uh, of Iran, most of what we see uh, and this map was once a part of the Ottoman Empire uh, before uh, the British and the French put an end to it at the end of the World War, World War I. Uh, I would like to mention also that the foreign policy of uh, Turkey also has domestic functions. Uh, it mobilizes uh, voters because some of the foreign policy acts uh, are very popular. And second, of course, uh, particularly in the last year or two, it distracts uh, the public from uh, domestic problems. Uh, they have a quite economic crisis now. I want to say, uh, to bring to you a few examples of the Islamist uh, dimension of uh, the Turkish foreign policy. First of all, they are more active, and all this is in great contrast to the Kemalist tradition that who, you know, was dominant in Turkey, a uh, secular tradition, uh, until uh, 2002. Uh, they are, uh, became active in the organization of Islamic countries. Uh, a Turk headed the organization for 10 years. They hosted uh, two uh, uh, summits of this organization, to 2016, 2017. Of course, uh, everybody knows that uh, they are uh, supporting Hamas, which is an Islamist organization, a, a, a version of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Palestinian version, while AKP is a Turkish version of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they are hosting uh, Hamas operatives uh, in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, we just, uh, you know, it was announced that they have also uh, provided them, and those are terrorists actually, with, uh, with Turkish passports, which makes, uh, travel for them easier, much easier. Uh, they host also about 30,000 Muslim Brotherhood Egyptians that basically fled uh, uh, Egypt uh, when um, uh, President Morsi, the Islamist president, was uh, demoted uh, in 2013. Um, and they host all uh, kind of other Islamists uh, from all over the world. Uh, they had a mixed attitude toward ISIS, that's the Islamic State, uh, particularly when they fought the Kurds, which are seen as a danger, a grave danger, because they may create irredentist uh, claims to, to Turkey. Uh, and uh, they supplied uh, weapons, they allowed access to ISIS in Syria, uh, they uh, uh, took care of the ISIS wounded uh, uh, people, uh, that fought uh, against uh, Syria, against Iraq. Uh, also, uh, they are aligned with Qatar. Qatar is, you can see here, small Qatar. Uh, Qatar is uh, a, a small uh, emirate uh, which uh, has adopted uh, a very Islamist uh, uh, orientation uh, and uh, it is also very rich, which uh, it helps Turkey, they get money from, uh, from Qatar, particularly nowadays when they have economic trouble. And also they enjoy uh, the soft power of, uh, of Qatar, uh, its famous Al Jazeera network. 
which has been, of course, uh, very uh, influential in the Arab Spring. And uh, since then, it uh, uh, continues to convey Islamist messages and helps uh, Turkey uh, gain uh, a good uh, public opinion, uh, particularly in the Muslim world. I think also that uh, uh, they are funding mosques in the Balkans. Uh, we have now three Muslim states in, in the Balkans, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, and Albania, and uh, we see in all of them uh, Turkish presence. Uh, and they try also to Islamize the Turkish diaspora, uh, particularly in Germany, uh, where they have uh, a few million of Turks, uh, and Erdogan visits them and <laughs> agitates against uh, Chancellor Merkel, uh, and all this in the name of, uh, of Islam. Uh, it intervenes on the side of Islamists uh, in uh, civil wars, uh, in Libya, for example, which we'll elaborate later on, and also uh, just recently they started their uh, intervention in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, also very recently, they decided to send uh, weapons to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood faction, small Muslim Brotherhood fa fa uh, faction in, in Lebanon, uh, particularly after uh, the uh, explosion in Beirut, and actually they are competing there with the French over influence in, in Lebanon and this French-Turkish uh, uh, competition, we'll see it also uh, in Libya. Turkey uh, basically tries uh, to uh, gain the leadership of the Muslim world. And for doing, in order to do that, it challenges primarily two countries in the Middle East, Egypt, which is, you know, the most important Arab country and the, uh, where, you know, the Al-Azhar University, uh, the, the Islamist, uh, Islam leadership, religious leadership is, and of course, Saudi Arabia, which hosts Mecca and Medina, the important religious sites to, to Islam. Uh, and there is a competition uh, with those uh, two countries over the leadership. Uh, one way to uh, uh, gain uh, in this uh, competition is to uh, accuse Egypt as well as Saudi Arabia of having links with Israel. Uh, because in the Muslim world, as we know, uh, Israel is not uh, very much liked. Um, and now I would like to, uh, with your uh, permission, to move to the Mediterranean, which uh, has uh, made uh, a lot of news in recent days. And I'll uh, uh, show you another map of the Mediterranean. And uh, you can see it here, it's uh, taken from The Economist, a good newspaper, not only very pro israeli but uh, you know, it is a good newspaper, and this is from the last issue, I think last week we issue. And uh, I will try maybe to increase it if possible. No, it doesn't work. So uh, this, uh, we see uh, the Mediterranean. Turkey is a Mediterranean power. It has uh, the largest uh, navy in this area, larger than Egypt, of course, larger than Israel. We have a very small uh, navy, larger than Greece. And uh, uh, it uh, has challenged the borders of the Aegean. This is Aegean. The Aegean is here. We see the Aegean islands of, uh, that belong to Greece. Here is Rhodes, this is Crete. Uh, the, at the end of uh, World War I, there was a Lausanne Treaty in 1922, which delineated the borders of modern Turkey. They are challenging it. Uh, actually, uh, these borders uh, include also uh, areas uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, in Syria and in Iraq, uh, but this is uh, the uh, area they are disputing. 
Uh, it's an old enmity between Greece and Turkey, uh, and uh, uh, the issue seems to be economical. You can see, actually, those dots, those dots here, are gas fields. The gas fields uh, are, uh, of course, uh, important uh, uh, bonus, uh, economic bonus, and uh, we should uh, remember that uh, Turkey is, uh, has no energy sources. It's dependent on energy from Russia, from North, and from uh, East, from Iran. And it wants, of course, uh, to be able to have its own uh, energy sources. It was uh, discovered already uh, the, in 2010, the Leviathan in Israel. Afterwards, a year later, Aphrodite in, in the Cyprus economic zone. And uh, recently, two years ago, uh, Egypt, a huge gas field uh, zone. Uh, the Turks uh, simply eye to this, uh, to those riches uh, because uh, uh, they want it. And they uh, also are disputing, challenging the United Nations uh, law on the seas. And uh, the, the, according to this law, uh, countries have an economic, an exclusive economic zone. And they dispute the fact that islands have also an uh, uh, econo exclusive economic zone. <laughs> and I can fully understand why <laughs> they are disputing it. If you see roads, it's very close to, uh, to, uh, to Turkey. Uh, another small island here, Katstilos or Kas in Turkish, is just a few miles away from the Turkish coast. And uh, it also claims an economic zone. So uh, they uh, are disputing. And of course, they are also in Cyprus. Since 1974, the northern part of Turkey has been occupied by Turkey. And they dispute uh, the claims of uh, the Republic of Cyprus, the Greek Cy Cypriots, uh, which is this area. They think part of it is, uh, uh, belongs to them. And uh, uh, of course, when the Turks think something belongs to them, they don't go always to the courts. They send their ships <laughs> to, uh, uh, to survey the gas and uh, uh, accompanied by their strong navy. <laughs> Actually, they <laughs> kicked out an Israeli survey ship from the Cyprus economic zone as well. And they bully Cyprus saying, you know, we are partners. We are your partners. Uh, now, uh, this is, of course, an uneasy situation. And uh, they tried for years to convince Israel to uh, take its gas, which is here, to Cyprus, or to the northern part of Cyprus, from here to Turkey, in order to put it in their, uh, what they call the energy bridge. Basically, there is an uh, important uh, uh, pipeline from Azerbaijan going via Georgia to Turkey and from there to Europe. Uh, this is uh, one uh, leverage, by the way, the Turks have uh, on Europe, they transfer uh, um, energy. Another important leverage, I'm sure you are aware, they are able to uh, uh, send uh, as many uh, refugees as they want uh, into Europe, and uh, they, they got the Europeans to pay not to send it. And of course, this is another typical, uh, you know, Turkish behavior. You don't want me to do something, pay for it. So uh, uh, the Turks are uh, here, and uh, uh, here comes in the Libyan intervention. Libya is here. In Libya, basically the Turks are capitalizing upon the weakness of the Arab states. After uh, the, what's the misnomer of the Arab Spring, uh, many Arab states uh, become failed states uh, with no monopoly over use of force, and they had civil wars. This is Syria, Libya, Yemen, Iraq. After the Americans destroyed Iraq, you know, they, uh, they wanted democracy there, and, you know, it, it ended up with, uh, with chaos and Iranian uh, influence, but this is a different story. 
So uh, they intervened in the uh, war in Libya. In Libya, there are two factions fighting. On the western side, there is a Tripoli uh, government headed by Faraj, and uh, uh, it is, has Islamic links. It is faced by an uh, eastern uh, group, uh, which is led by a self-called uh, Marshal Haftar, Uh, not a great military genius, but he still calls himself uh, a marshal, and they are fighting against each other. Uh, Haftar uh, uh, succeeded in getting the support of uh, Egypt, UAE, and even the Russians, and there are some rumors that uh, Israel also sells some weapons to, uh, to Haftar. You know, uh, business is business, we have to sell. So, uh, uh, And they advanced toward uh, Tripoli, and then Turkey decided to intervene. And uh, they intervened with military, their own military, but also with uh, uh, mercenaries, the Sadat forces, which are uh, you know, uh, troops uh, that are not officially Turkish. The Russians do the same. And uh, um, it's like, uh, the Americans also have this type of troops. Uh, Anyway, they succeeded in convincing the Faraj government the, on the eastern part, which is the Islamist uh, you know, links, uh, to sign in November, last November, uh, an agreement on delineating the economic zone, the exclusive economic zone uh, of the both countries, which do not border each other. Libya is here, Turkey is here, and you can see that those two brown lines, it's a diagonal, which uh, Turkey and uh, Libya, you know, the small, you know, the government uh, of Tripoli, decided that this is the economic zone of both countries and this divides, and uh, they will have rights to uh, explore those uh, riches that are beneath the sea. The, if you take a look at the map, you clearly see that this uh, economic, this, this arrangement ignores greed, ignores Rhodes, And of course, what is uh, important from an Israeli point of view, if we want to build a pipeline from here, well, our gas, to Cyprus, and from here, this is a planned pipeline, to, to Greece, and afterwards to Italy, uh, I'm not sure this pipeline will, will be built, but in any, because of the low uh, prices of gas, so it doesn't pay to do it now. In any case, they can interfere. They have a right to interfere, uh, And uh, this is something, uh, of course, uh, uh, Israel didn't like, and neither Egypt, nor Greece, nor Cyprus. And we've seen uh, recently, uh, this month actually, uh, another agreement on delineation of the economic, exclusive economic zone between Greece here and, uh, and Egypt. You see those two uh, Turkey's lines, green lines, this is, Their agreement, of course, it uh, uh, conflicts with the Turkish-Libyan uh, agreement. Uh, the Egyptians uh, are, uh, um, uh, see Turkey as a traditional uh, rival in the Middle East. Uh, they, have, they are close to, to Libya. They uh, threatened that they will intervene militarily if uh, the uh, Faraj forces Uh, helped by the uh, Turks will continue to advance eastward. And uh, now the Turks uh, make a muscle, have uh, military exercises <laughs> in, in the areas that uh, seem to be part of the Greek economic zone, uh, Cyprus, Cypriot economic zone. And uh, this is uh, becoming an international conflict because the French are also siding with, uh, with Egypt And uh, uh, the part of the, the European Union. And uh, Qatar, Turkey's ally, has also intervened and supports the Farage Islamist uh, regime together with Turkey. Uh, so uh, actually what we may see now is uh, um, maybe some military clashes between NATO allies. Greece, Turkey, France, which is here, but it has a, a, a naval presence here, 
uh, with Turkey, the, actually the EU, I don't know if you are aware, decided to put some kind of embargo on arms on Libya and try to imp- uh, enforce it. Uh, but <laughs> the Turks came with their navy and kicked them out. And uh, so, uh, and there is also the French-Turkish tensions over Lebanon here, which is also uh, important, uh, literal, uh, you know, for in the East Mediterranean. Uh, to remind you, and we'll get into it in a moment, if we'll have time, to, you know, here is Syria. This Syria, the Turks are also in Syria, Northern Syria, and uh, um, they maybe try to... Um, have a basis also in Lebanon in order to have a better leverage on the Syrian uh, regime. So uh, this is uh, the current uh, mess that uh, we see uh, nowadays in the East Mediterranean, which involves, you know, the pro-Israeli, Egyptian, you know, the moderate forces in the Middle East, vis-a-vis the radical forces, which are Qatar and Turkey, and uh, uh, it all happens uh, in Libya. Um, unfortunately, uh, the U.S. is not a, a real player here. And um, uh, it allows Tully, uh, Turkey to bully, uh, you know, the, the countries, which all of them are, are weaker uh, than, uh, than Turkey. Uh, but Turkey shows great determination. Uh, Turkey... Uh, I'm sure uh, you are aware, is not a great uh, NATO ally. Uh, it uh, bought, uh, despite American objections, uh, S-400, you know, surface to air missiles, uh, digressing from the policy of, of NATO. Uh, it was not uh, deterred by uh, the American threats not to supply the F-35s. And eventually, United States uh, decided not to supply those, uh, uh, you know, modern uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, I, I had a modest part in convincing the, uh, the house, the, the hill in, in Washington uh, not to do it uh, with briefings. Uh, and uh, still, they are uh, actually, they, uh, uh, this month, they decided on an additional deal of s uh, 400. Uh, again, uh, it was a, a, it's a, a div- a, an act uh, against American wishes. Um, and it has done it not only uh, on those issues, and here it's important, it's an important issue for Israel, but for also international security. It has defied American wishes on Iran. It voted against uh, when it was a member of the United Nations Security Council, it voted against uh, the sanctions imposed on Iran because of its nuclear uh, program, and actually participated participates actively in circumventing those sanctions. Uh, we, we know about uh, uh, Turkish banks, but uh, other actors within the, the Turkish political system are uh, circumventing uh, the, uh, those sanctions, which helps uh, Iran uh, get through those difficult times. Uh, there are hopes uh, in Israel as well as elsewhere that eventually uh, Turkey, a big country, will be able to uh, counterbalance Iran in the Middle East, but it has not uh, happened primarily because the American, because the uh, Islamic connection. Uh, Turkey sees Iran as an Islamist sister state. Uh, Erdogan, uh, in one of his interviews, said uh, openly that he feels much more comfortable in the shuk, in the souks, in the markets of, uh, of Tehran rather than in uh, Champs-Élysées. You know, everybody's entitled to his own taste, but, you know, he made it quite clear uh, where, uh, where he stands. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, to use the uh, time that it's still left uh, to uh, remind you what kind of uh, position Turkey has vis-a-vis Israel. Uh, 
first of all, uh, it turns uh, Jerusalem into an Islamic issue. And uh, this is, of course, not something that uh, Israel wants it to be. Uh, we don't want to be the enemy of the Islamic world. They are, uh, you know, just recently when he turned the Hagia Sophia in, uh, into, a, into a mosque, he said the next target is Al-Aqsa, uh, to liberate Al-Aqsa on the Temple Mount and to liberate Jerusalem from the Zionist rule. Uh, I'm not sure you are aware of the uh, very great effort on part of Turkey in Jerusalem to subvert uh, Israeli sovereignty. Uh, some uh, uh, Turkish agencies are working here. Uh, actually, we see in the old city uh, Turkish flags. Uh, he's successful in getting you know, popular support. Uh, there is uh, subsidized Turkish tourism uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem. And uh, they uh, see themselves as uh, uh, returning to the Ottoman times uh, when the Jerusalem was part of their empire. Uh, they are uh, very blunt or very hostile in terms of their statements comparing uh, Israel to Nazi Germany, uh, not only siding uh, with, uh, uh, with the Palestinians, but they are siding with Hamas. They could have sided with the PA with, uh, in Ramallah, but they side with uh, the enemies, uh, no, avowed enemies of the state of Israel. Uh, they are uh, interfering in uh, Israeli-NATO relations. Uh, the decision-making process in NATO is such that it allows the veto power of the Turks to uh, um, uh, not allow uh, better relations between NATO and, uh, and Israel. Uh, to s- one, uh, for a while, uh, they uh, stopped from doing it uh, because uh, the Israeli apology. I was asked about it by my government and I told them they shouldn't do it. It's not going to help, not because of any uh, sensitivity to national honor, but uh, mm-hmm. indeed it didn't help. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think also that we should uh, uh, realize that Turkey is leading the campaign against uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, uh, deal with Israel, which just uh, happened. Uh, and they are very critical, of course, of uh, the UAE uh, for uh, uh, not waiting until the Palestinian uh, question is resolved. Um, it allows Hamas to um, organize terrorist activities from uh, Turkey. And we have found in our security services have found direct links of terrorist activities uh, in the West Bank uh, for, uh, by, uh, you know, with Hamas operatives. Uh, I think also that, uh, as I mentioned, they try uh, to prevent uh, the building of uh, this pipeline from Israel to, uh, to Europe. Uh, they do it for two reasons. First of all, they don't want Europe to to get uh, gas from uh, from the East Mediterranean, unless this East Mediterranean gas is channeled through their pipelines, and also to make life for Israel uh, more uh, more difficult. And I mentioned already that they didn't refrain from uh, you know using uh, quasi force in preventing an Israeli ship uh, carrying out uh, seismic. Uh, explorations in the economic, uh, exclusive economic zone of, of Cyprus. Having said that, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, be able to detect a, a streak of pragmatism in Erdogan's policies vis-a-vis Israel. Uh, first of all, we still have a diplomatic relations, low level diplomatic relations, but diplomatic relations. Uh, and uh, the official title of the diplomat in, in, in each, uh, you know, in Tel Aviv or in Ankara uh, is, is uh, relatively low, but it's a senior diplomat in both places. The bilateral trade 
continues. It's blooming. Actually, over $5 billion uh, uh, trade between the two countries. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, Israel has become a bridge for Turkish goods to the Arab world after Syria couldn't be used anymore for Turkish trucks going south. It was a civil war, so the only safe uh, route is via Haifa and Ashdod ports, particularly Haifa, and from there, there are special arrangements for those trucks to go to Jordan from there, the rest of the Arab world. Uh, also, an important, uh, uh, very lucrative uh, business is uh, Tel Aviv-Istanbul uh, line. Uh, I'm not sure you are aware, uh, you know, before Corona, I don't know what's exactly now, but there were 11 daily flights from Tel Aviv to Istanbul. Uh, because uh, Turkish Airlines, uh, you know, is a hub for uh, going all over the world uh, via Istanbul, the Istanbul airport, Atatürk airport. Also, they want this connection uh, for uh, allowing, of course, Israeli tourists to come to, uh, to Turkey once uh, Turkey was uh, uh, probably the most desirable destination for Israeli tourists, but also to be able to uh, fly to Israel and to have a presence uh, at the Temple Mount. Uh, Israel vis-a-vis -vis Turkey is careful uh, because it's a big country, it's a strong country. Uh, we don't want a conflict, uh, a military conflict with Turkey. Actually, I think uh, uh, we made clear in different uh, venues that uh, in case there will be a Greek uh, Cypriot, you know, clashes with, or French with, uh, with the Turks, uh, we will not uh, participate. Uh, we'll do it, you know, uh, supply intelligence, we'll supply other things that may be needed, but we'll stay away from uh, such a, a military conflict. Um, we hope that uh, the Americans eventually will uh, uh, try to moderate the Turkish ambitions. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, Obama, you know, as well as Trump, both see uh, for unexplainable uh, reasons, uh, you know, which, you know, rational reasons, is that, uh, you know, uh, they cannot really be with uh, uh, a friend with such a thug like Erdogan. Uh, but, uh, there is something in Erdogan's personality that is very convincing, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both were great friends of, uh, of Erdogan. Uh, of course, we should uh, also buttress the alliance with uh, Greece, Egypt, Cyprus, UAE. Uh, and um, by the way, uh, in, in the UAE-Israeli uh, deal, there was, of course, the Turkish dimension. They are afraid also of Turkey, not only of Iran. So uh, on this uh, happy note, I think I, I spoke uh, as much as I was allowed to. That's it. That's great. And let me just jump in over here as well. For those who may have joined during this, uh, this Zoom session, this is Professor Ephraim Embar, who you've been listening to uh, for the last 45 minutes from the Jerusalem Institute of Strate Strategy and Security. And he is in Jerusalem right now. Uh, we have got a number of questions that have come through at this point. And again, uh, time permitting, I... Um, would ask you, I would request if you do have a question on Turkey Israel relations. And the, as you heard, a great deal of information just came. I mean, pretty much the whole geopolitical um, area, region, uh, crammed into 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm not quite sure how much we can take out of all of that. But let me firstly start off with a question myself. Now, I recall as somebody who's been a correspondent in the area, uh, well, pretty much since the early 90s, 91, I think it was, just after the first Gulf War. And I remember mm, late 90s, maybe the early part of the uh, 21st century, um, how under Erdogan, Turkey was a good friend of Israel. And in fact, when Shimon Peres was asked to speak several times on news networks, he also pointed out that 
when it comes to the United Nations, Israel stands no chance whatsoever. But we do have friends out of the 57 Islamic countries in the world, 56 of them will always vote against Israel. Who was he referring to? Turkey. What has changed? And obviously, it's Erdogan who's become much more religious. He's playing to his Islamic crowd. But is there something more that has changed Turkey's attitude towards Israel? Well, first of all, indeed, the Islamic dimension is very important. Uh, but we should uh, also uh, be aware of another development in the Middle East, uh, which is uh, the exit of the Americans. And the Americans don't care, uh, don't care that much about the Middle East because they have enough oil, they don't need so much the region. So uh, regional powers uh, have greater leeway in doing what they really want. Uh, this is true, by the way, also of Israel. Uh, so uh, this is another reason. Uh, I so think also that uh, the uh, good days of the 90s um, and even the beginning of, uh, uh, of Erdogan who in contrast to Morsi, the Egyptian, was very careful. And this mm. is why he's still in power. Uh, he, uh, so uh, the, the attitudes of, uh, toward Israel were um, uh, partly, uh, good attitudes were partly prevalent in the uh, city people, in the secular people, um, <laughs> in, while the hinterland of Turkey, uh, which is still, you know, very traditional and to some extent religious, and not all religious people I know are radicals, of course. Mm. Uh, myself, uh, with a kippah on my head, and I don't suppose- so Just, just to be clear, I, I just want to understand. So because the Americans have actually moved away from, uh, from their uh, pressurizing Turkey, you're suggesting that it is because the Americans are not putting pressure on Turkey, um, that they're just free to do what it is that they wish to do. Israel, the, the Turks have always seen Israel as a, a lobbying. Okay. In the evening news. Then, I, I can tell you in the, in the 70s when uh, the Americans imposed the embargo on Turkey uh, because of their uh, conquest of Northern Cyprus, uh, they sent two Jews to New York, two Turkish Jews to Washington, and they worked together with the Turkish, with the Israeli embassy to try to move, uh, remove those, uh, those sanctions against the Jewish lobby, against the Greek lobby. An interesting, uh, you know, <laughs> incident. Oh, no, no. On another topic, and then we go on to the questions from some of the audience, uh, and we have more than 200 who are viewing this evening as well, so a number of questions have come in so far. But just let me ask you one more from my point, and that is uh, the news networks in Israel uh, at the end of last week were reporting on Turkey and the tensions between Turkey and Greece and the Turkish ships uh, preventing the Greece ships. There was a lot of tension. They were actually looking at Israel siding with Greece how do you see this developing over the coming weeks and months? Well, much depends on the Turks. If they are uh, willing to, uh, to reach some kind of an agreement, and I just read today that the Turkish foreign minister said he is willing to discuss uh, with no conditions uh, with the Greeks, you know, what to do about uh, the Aegean. And, and I must say, I, I think they have a case. Uh, so uh, if there is going to be some kind of... Um, Know, compromise, uh, there may, may be a chance to, uh, uh, to prevent war or uh, military clashes. But uh, the Turkish mood uh, is very belligerent. They feel strong. They feel strong for a variety of reasons. And uh, uh, they uh, feel they have freedom of action. They are strong uh, militarily. So uh, we may see uh, war. Yeah, definitely. This is a positive. Okay. Well, something uh, uh, that's a pleasant uh, thought to, to leave. But let me move to the questions. Uh, just after you started speaking, uh, Joseph uh, wrote the following question. This is something I don't know too much about. Uh, so hopefully I won't make too many mistakes on these words. Uh, can you compare historically Kemal um, Atatürk's, Atatürk. uh, Tur Atatürk's uh, Turkey to the present situation in Turkey, especially as far as the status of the Jews go? 
I'm not quite sure I understand the question entirely myself. In Turkey, and uh, uh, in uh, the area of Atatürk, there were, uh, you know, concentration camps for Jews. You know, so it's, uh, it's not a rosy, Jews have never been in a rosy, you know, situation in modern Turkey. Uh, it's a Muslim country with a lot of uh, anti-Jewish uh, stereotypes. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, during Erdogan, it becomes more... Uh, uh, more pronounced, uh, the Jews of Istanbul are, are many of them are leaving, uh, some of them to Israel, some of them uh, benefit from the possibility of getting a, a, a Portuguese or Spanish passport, because they are from the Spanish Jews, Portuguese Jews that left, uh, you know, in the 15th century. Sure. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I was going to ask you about that. How many Jewish people are still left uh, in, in Turkey? I believe mostly in Istanbul. It's a place that I used to travel quite a lot. And I did uh, several talks there, actually, uh, several years ago. How many are still left there? Maybe 10,000, 12,000. There is a very small community also in Izmir. But it's... Uh, Jews are living. You know, it's not uh, the best place for them. Hmm. Uh, Barbara asks, does this recent military aggression mean that Turkey is no longer interested in joining the EU? And also, what does NATO think about the situation? Well, first of all, uh, I think uh, Turkey was really interested in, uh, uh, in joining the EU, particularly EU, before yeah. Erdogan. Hmm. Um, uh, but uh, the EU gave it a cold shoulder, uh, made many conditions, and uh, basically... Uh, uh, the Turks uh, got insulted and uh, they, <laughs> they no longer want to be part of Europe. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure uh, it's such a bad decision, you know, to be part of Europe. Uh, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, the Brits leave the EU. So I, I don't know if uh, they are no longer interested. Uh, I think it was perhaps a lot was to do with the fact that the EU were making it very difficult to Turkey to join. Right. Turkey felt that they were changing the, uh, the goalpost all the time. And in the end, Turkey just put up two fingers towards them. And of course, as you mentioned earlier on, they're sending a lot of these uh, refugees and Syrian refugees into Europe just to try and stick it to the Europeans. One important uh, you know, uh, observation is that the Turks, particularly the Erdogan, used the EU-Turkish uh, negotiations in order to neutralize the military, to not to give it the constitutional rights, to remove the constitutional rights to intervene in the political system in order to adapt to the European notion of the separation between uh, you know, uh, mm. military and the political. Very simple question from Ayal, who asked, why doesn't Israel simply severe ties with Turkey? I think you kind of touched on that earlier. What, what's in it? You know, why should we do it? You know? The why? Ministry of Foreign Affairs definitely doesn't want it. You know, it's a post for a few more diplomats. And, uh, Always good to keep the channels open, even if it's a cold piece. Yeah, it's, uh, we want to a, a channel of communication, a direct channel of communication uh, with Ankara, uh, mm. that, which is an important country, you know. Not sure if this one's going to be applicable to, it's a bit of a religious question from Joseph, who asks, are you, how are you on religion? How am I on religion? Well, let's see. Um, uh, Joseph asks, how does Turkey explain the fact that in the Quran, the prophet, presumably that's the prophet Muhammad, uh, says Jerusalem belongs to the Jews? Is that something yeah, I'm answer? a religious person. <laughs> okay. and I know. But you're a Jew, you're not Muslim. The text has so many interpretations. And, you know, you choose your own interpretation. I choose my own verses and my own interpretation. And I'm sure uh, Muslims do the same. You know, you can find in the Quran so many, you know, okay. verses. Let me, let me see if I can see a, a question that you can possibly answer directly. Make it, um, uh, let me see. Uh, David is asking, has the official Turkish protection of Turkish Jews been affected by these developments? So again, you mentioned it was difficult for... No, they are, uh, they are responsible. They, they definitely see themselves responsible for the welfare of the Jews. They defend uh, uh, the, uh, the few synagogues left in, uh, uh, in, in Istanbul. And if you want to go in, you have to show a passport. You... No, they are taking uh, good care of the security uh, of the Jews. 
uh, and uh, they distinguish between their Jews and mm. Israel. Although uh, it's not always a clear distinction, but the government definitely tries to make it. Uh, with time fast running out, here's an interesting question from Sousa. What kind of domestic political pressure does Erdogan currently have? Uh, the, the only problem uh, Turkey uh, has, a big problem, is of course the economy. The lira went down, I believe, uh, from the beginning of the year, at least 20% vis-a-vis the dollar. Uh, uh, and uh, he uh, also, uh, during the corona crisis, there is no tourism. Tourism has been a, a very important uh, source of uh, foreign currency. So the economic front is problematic. Also, he faces uh, some kind of opposition from uh, um, disappointed uh, uh, AKP, you know, his own party people. They established a different party. Uh, and uh, there is also less present uh, the Gulenist uh, uh, religious movement, which was uh, almost demolished after the coup of uh, 2016. Uh, but uh, Erdogan, as a political persona, really has no uh, challenger. And uh, the next elections are in next, for parliament as well as for uh, um, uh, president are, uh, are in 2023. And I really don't see yet anybody that can uh, become a... Sure, but to be clear, the reason why he probably doesn't have a real challenger is because if anyone gets close, a little bit like events, political events in Russia, that they suddenly find themselves uh, on charges and they are arrested. Is that true to say? No, I don't think so. I think that he, uh, he doesn't face, uh, he doesn't, doesn't have the modus operandi of, of Putin. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he is uh, a leader above all others. You know, I, we must admit it. This is a source of his popularity. He won elections, uh, more or less uh, free election. Uh, of course, he doesn't like to lose. You know, he, and, uh, you know, he may play with the numbers a little bit. It depends who mm. counts the votes. But basically... Uh, but that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, you, you feel, because I'm quite surprised you say that, you feel that the elections that he has won, that they are legitimate elections and that there was no stuffing of ballot boxes? Well, I, I wouldn't vouch for every ballot, but <laughs> I think... Okay. because there are question marks I think there were made about foreign observers and uh, uh, the threshold is very high. It's 10% in, in, in Turkey. Right. And... Uh, Unlike Israel, which is 3.25. He has a coalition now with the MHP, which is a very nationalist party. He Mm. actually lost its majority in the the last election. Mm. He's, you know, uh, majority in parliament. And uh, he plays politics very well. Once he was uh, very lenient towards the Kurds, now he's very anti-Kurdish, which is popular in Turkey. So he is, we have to admit, he's a popular leader in this country. Uh, no, not uh, my preferred leader, but that's a Turkish taste. Uh, Professor Embao, you also talked about um, the reservoir, uh, the gas, the pipes, and whether it would take place in the foreseeable future, whether it would be put off for various other reasons as well. Uh, this is something that I recently wrote in the last couple of days uh, in a long article um, about Netanyahu, the UAE, and mentioned about the gas reservoirs that Israel's found, perhaps the largest reservoirs uh, in the entire world. And as a result, uh, well, okay. Um, and as a result, uh, you'll get an opportunity to, to read that when the Zionist Federation uh, magazine comes out. Uh, but Netanyahu has managed to go ahead and establish and real, really build up ties with Italy and Greece and Cyprus in order to go ahead and build this, um, give a resource as such, an Israeli resource to these countries, to bring these countries closer together. Uh, uh, What I was going to ask was, Turkey obviously sees this. Why doesn't Turkey just say, you know what? Israel's got something that we also need. This gas is going to Greece. It's going to Italy. It's going to Cyprus. We should get a piece of this. Let's just calm our selves down a little bit, come down from the tree a little bit, and maybe get a little bit closer towards Israel. What would you say on that? Well, actually, Israel tried it several times. And there is a strong pro-Turkish faction in, in the Israeli foreign ministry. And uh, it, 
it didn't work. We really tried. Actually, the most economic way to transfer uh, the, the gas from Israel to Europe is via Turkish uh, pipeline, because it's the shortest via Cyprus. Mm. Uh, but the Turks were not uh, willing to, uh, to play in other, uh, with us in order not to give us the satisfaction of, uh, uh, of uh, sending their, our gas and paying for it. And, uh, and uh, strategically, I'm not sure it was uh, the wrong decision uh, uh, not to do it, uh, because we don't want... Uh, uh, the Turks to have the, their hands on our gas fossil. So they even talked about a, a, a line that would bring water to Israel and gas to, uh, to, um, uh, to Turkey. Of course, we do need, don't need the water anymore. Our desalinization plants are doing... But of the course, this, uh, the, the fact that uh, Turkey is almost on the outside then of this gas... Um, uh, treaty as such with these countries, with Israel and these countries through the gas lines. That just pushes Turkey much closer towards Russia and President Putin. Uh, well, <laughs> the Turks play an interesting game. First of all, don't forget that they shut down a Russian airplane, uh, you know, three years ago, I believe. So uh, they, are, they can be tough with the Russians. Uh, the Russians are against them in Libya. Uh, so uh, they are uh, Russian-Turkish tensions uh, in Syria, uh, in the area the Turks are controlling, and uh, the, uh, the Russians try to limit their uh, influence to help the Assad regime. Uh, so uh, it is a very, um, you know, uh, sensitive relationship between Turkey and uh, Russia, uh, and this is why probably the Americans don't kick out uh, the uh, Turks from NATO because they don't want to push it into the Russian orbit. Uh, although the Turks are able to have their own independent policy, but this is one really uh, strategic reason that makes sense not to push too much Turkey outside uh, the Western alliance. So we, haven't really, we haven't really spoken about the United States and of course the uh, election coming up as well. Um, I was told that through a source that President Trump who had recently referred to Erdogan as his friend, as sometimes he does on the podium, he was rebuked for this from somebody who he respects because um, if he doesn't respect them, then they've obviously lost the job, uh, to not say that because it just doesn't look very good for foreign relations. So with the election coming up and with Trump, what, you, you raise your eyes on that. What, what is your take on this, sir? Well, I think that the, the Turks want Trump to win. Uh, they, they just, uh, you know, Biden made an anti-Turkish statement and uh, they told him, you know, in a very vulgar language you know, what he should do. So uh, <laughs> they uh, bet on, uh, on, uh, on Trump, Trump uh, because he has this, uh, you know, very uh, curious, good relationship uh, with, uh, with Erdogan. Would that be good for Donald Trump to continue to say my friend, President Erdogan in Turkey, or would that go against him? You see, first of all, I'm not an expert on American politics, but I would say that uh, the foreign policy issues are not that important uh, in domestic politics. You know, maybe Israel, Jerusalem with evangelicals, but uh, what really counts in American uh, you know, elections is basically uh, how the economy is doing, will he be able to deal effectively with uh, COVID-19. And, and Turkey is something very distant. Uh, you know, I, I, I would dare to say that uh, most uh, uh, Americans don't even, even the slightest idea where Turkey is. Um, just looking at Sam, who's just asked, I'm trying to think of this one. I should know this and I'm not sure. Um, obviously in the Islamic world, the majority of Muslims around the world are either Shiite or Sunni. Turkey, what is the majority of um, uh, Muslims inside of Turkey? 99% Sunnis. Okay, that's and, exactly. Uh, this is why they, they, you know, it's another reason for seeing them as a counterbalance to Iran, which is Shiite. But they don't behave like uh, the Sunni, you know, moderate camps. They behave like the Sunni radical camp. Out of curiosity, where did the 1% of Shiite come from then in that case? Uh, from Iraq or Iran? No, oh, they are uh, other, you know, they are still a little bit Christians and uh, Armenians still, and uh, 
but uh, you know also uh, alawi is a small guard of group yeah okay uh, and just finally uh, a question from myself as well and again uh, came from a defense source uh, in jerusalem uh, with regard to the threats that face israel today and of course it's well known uh, israel is faced with threats f- threats rather from uh, from gaza from the popular front for the liberation of palestine and uh, the Palestinian resi- resistance movement, and of course Hamas is pretty famous over there, Islamic Jihad, and uh, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs, and there's a whole bunch of groups, and there's different ISIS groups in Gaza, we all know that. Hezbollah in the north, the Iranians trying very hard to build bases in Syria, and Israel has admitted several times that they are bombing those bases to keep them out of that, push away the Iranian aggression. However, besides Iran being the biggest threat to Israel, they also say Turkey. And Turkey's desire to wish to perhaps rebuild an empire again, which could be a major threat. Now, to me, Iran is the major threat. So maybe Turkey comes a long way back in second place. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I agree that Iran is a major threat uh, to Israel, uh, primarily because uh, it's a nuclear program and uh, the success uh, of its proxies uh, all over the region. Uh, Turkey uh, is, uh, uh, for the first time, it was defined by the Israeli intelligence uh, this year as a threat. Uh, and uh, because it, uh, it is very hostile, because it helps terrorist organizations, uh, I think uh, my own sources tell me that they want to establish a presence on the Golan Heights in order to activate this front as well against us. So, uh, and this is, was one of the reasons they uh, decided not to destabilize the Assad regime. Uh, so, uh, Turkey has uh, cap- great capabilities uh, in mm-hmm. the Mediterranean, of course, uh, but also elsewhere. Uh, we should remember, I didn't have time to go over all the, uh, the map. I, uh, they are in, close to Bab- Babel Mandeb uh, Straits. They are in Yemen, they are in Somalia, mm. uh, challenging Saudi Arabia and Egypt, but Babel Ab, Babel Bad, Babel Mandeb Straits are uh, important also to us, uh, all our exports to the, to the East, to China, to Japan, to Korea, uh, to Australia are uh, going uh, via this uh, uh, waterway. So uh, uh, it threatens our uh, uh, interests also there. So uh, Turkey is... Uh, very serious opponent, and uh, I think the Israeli very cautious policy uh, is uh, warranted. So, in other words, it is a big threat, but as you say, some distance away from the Iranian threat today. And what about their expansion into Syria and taking big chunks of Kurdish areas in the north? Because it doesn't look like they're going to to withdraw from those areas. So surely this is the start of a build-up of um, holding on to this territory because who will kick them out? (laughs) Uh, They have established a present uh, over a strip of 145 kilometers from uh, uh, West Syria to the Iraqi border, about 30 kilometers wide. In those areas, uh, they are uh, turkifying the, the, the locals, the natives. We see uh, Turkish banks, the Turkish lira is uh, introduced, uh, the Turkish post is, uh, mail, mail is uh, operating there. Uh, there are signs in Turkish, uh, and uh, they are, uh, uh, as you correctly say, uh, there is a little chance to see them uh, out of uh, this region. Parts of this region, uh, all of those regions, were part of the Ottoman Empire. And they are s- saying openly that this area, this area, this was a big uh, battle, Ottoman battle in this year, in that year. Uh, and uh, they are going back to their uh, roots. So uh, in Syria, they are uh, uh, an active uh, actor uh, right. in Syria, but also to stop Kurdish uh, ambitions. Kurdish Expansion. Hopes to establish a uh, Rojava, you know, the, the Kurdish state from uh, the KRG, the Kurdish region in, uh, regional uh, government in, in northern Iraq, all the way to the Mediterranean, and they stopped it. 
and they stopped it. And you know, this month they, they attacked the Kurdish uh, uh, PKK, Kurdish uh, targets in uh, in Iraq. Uh, they have a pres- military presence also in northern Iraq. And mm-hmm. the Kurds, uh, because they are landlocked, they are very dependent upon Turkey. If they want to export their oil, uh, they can do it only via Turkey. So you've actually just given a very good reason as to why Israel and other countries wouldn't recognize an independent state of, of Kurdistan, simply because the Turks would just wipe it off immediately. <laughs> I don't think that uh, we should uh, recognize an independent state of Kurdistan. The Kurds are very divided, uh, and uh, I, I doubt very much if they are able to establish a state uh, with monopoly or use of force. There mm-hmm. are many clans there, and uh, it's a very complicated situation. Some of them are pro-Turkey, some of them are, are pro-Iranian, some of them work with, uh, with the Assad regime. Right. It's a big mishmash there, and it's... Uh, and some with the Turks and some with the Syrians. So I can see they're very divided. Professor Ephraim uh, Imbar, it's actually been very fascinating, and you've crammed in an awful lot of information into uh, a short 45 minutes uh, on this very, very difficult subject that uh, people have spent years and years and years discussing, and, and they still come away with, uh, with not really understanding the geopolitical scene. Uh, but you've managed to go ahead and, and make some in-depths, and I, I hope this has been helpful to, uh, to some of the viewers, to all of the viewers uh, this evening who've uh, tuned in. Thank you very, very much for your time this evening. Really appreciate sure, it. And, uh, if you have any uh, desire for additional knowledge, please visit uh, our uh, website, JISS.org. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to mention anyway. The Jerusalem Institute of Strategy and Security, of course, JISS.org.il uh, is the website with lots of information on there as well. It's really been a pleasure uh, speaking with you for the first time. And uh, thank you very much uh, again to the Zionist Federation uh, and to the World Zionist Organization in the United Kingdom. Uh, And again, thank you to you. Uh, More than 200 people registered for this event, 221 if I remember correctly. Uh, Coming up in the next few weeks uh, are various other talks. no dates have actually been confirmed. So the best thing is, as I've been told by by Steve, the CEO of the Zionist Federation, is to keep an eye out on social media, on the website of the Zionist Federation, on the Facebook page. Uh, Watch out for various other talks coming up. Uh, But until then, again, let me thank uh, Professor Ephraim Embar. Uh, It's after 10 p.m. here in Israel. So thank you again for your time. And uh, we wish wish every uh, every person this evening uh, a very 